Hi. Hi. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself to our audience and tell us what you do? Yeah. Uh, so I'm Natalie, and I am a UBC graduate, and I have a degree in visual arts and art history. And I also used to work in um, the Alpha Gallery on campus, and right now I'm a florist. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, can you tell us more about? Yeah, let's talk about your art first. What What did you do with visual art degree? Like, do you paint? Do you print? Or do you do sculpture? Or was flower a part of your artwork? I I well, I started. I've been a florist for five years, so on and off, I've been working part time at, when I was a student. But um, I guess my life as a florist has never really crossed over to my art. Um, I was primarily a painter back in the day. Back in the day. <laughs> I graduated just May and I'm saying back in the day. Um, I was a painter. I was a portrait painter. I was very much into portraits. Uh, I did a lot of projects on uh, set, just life models, a lot of portrait studies. Uh, whether they're drawings or paintings, I tend to, I, I find myself drawing to people a lot. So I did mostly that. Um, I also dabbled in printmaking. Uh, which is also very popular with my cohort of students. Um, that was fun. It was, I did a lot of screen printing. Uh, that is, when, if you have the equipment and resources for it in the studio, why not try it, right? It, it's a time to experiment. What kind of print? Um, I think a lot of our audience is not so familiar with printmaking. What, what, what are the themes or what are the format and sizes? Uh, we, I think we started off with really basic intaglio and relief printing, which is basically just carving into a matrix and then putting ink over it, rolling on top of it, and then just printing on a piece of paper. So that's the really basic of it. And then I started doing screen printing. So screen printing, the most famous person who has ever done screen printing is Andy Warhol. Those are, you see the Marilyn Monroe, you see Elvis Presley, all those works are screen printed. Um, so that's something that I got really into. I wasn't too interested in taglia or relief painting, uh, sorry, printing, but screen printing I got really into. So I did two years of screen printing, only screen printing, um, because it takes a lot of time to prep the matrix, mm. it takes a lot of time to print, you have to digitally prepare the images to print, um, you have to prepare the screen, which takes overnight, so that takes a lot of time. Um, but a lot of my friends and I just kind of sleep over in the studio. It's part of the fun though. It's it part is, of fun yeah. to be sleeping in print studios. I wish I had that kind of experience. Yeah. But too bad I'm not artsy or crafty at all. Oh, I, I'm, I'm sure you are. I <laughs> see. Well, um, that's really cool. And um, how about using art in your florist studies? Because you said you did, flower wasn't a theme in your art. It wasn't. Was art a theme in your Florist job? Yeah, I think so. I think in general, creativity just kind of it doesn't have boundaries, right? It just kind of manifests in itself into anything that you do. Um, floral arrangement itself is already very creative. Uh, we all we're all designers, so to speak. Um, in the studio, we exchange ideas. We all have our own style and or our own approach into floral designs. But then we also come together and exchange ideas, which I think is kind of the same in the studio environment that I was in, that artists or students have their own styles, but then they, we influence each other, uh, we exchange ideas. Yeah, it's the same, I guess, in that sense, it's kind of similar in terms of work dynamic and studio dynamics. Fine. Yeah. And you also worked with in the art gallery, and then in, even in school you did art curating. Uh, tell us more about that, like you heard what I said earlier too. Um, how is that different from a more a history exhibition or material object exhibition? It's well, the gallery that I worked at was a contemporary art gallery. It's a, it's called Art History and Visual Arts um, Art Gallery. It's just basically a departmental gallery of UBC, and we have I've, I've had the privilege of working in the new art gallery, which opened about two year, a year before I um, started working there. And I started working um, for, luckily, I don't know how I got so lucky, the year I got the job when I was supposed to have my ex uh, graduating exhibition, which is an annual exhibition that all students can participate if they choose to. And most students, they want to be in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity to showcase all the work that you've yeah, been working on for the past five years. So, and it's 
we have a great space because our new building just opened that year. So in that sense, I was very privileged to work in the art in the very pristine, it was very new, very clean art gallery. Uh, as a contemporary art gallery, I would say we were we did a lot of exhibitions within the faculty, so we invited artists. We also invite artists from out of UBC, out of the campus, but we also we started off with faculty staff, so we did a lot of visual arts professors. They pro they exhibited their work. Um, sometimes we would also have graduated students that would come back and also display their work in exhibitions. Um, and then there would be time that we would invite other artists, probably from co like connections we've made through professors, through um, artists studio visits that we've made before so we did a it's a variety of exhibitions that we put up yeah i would say it's very different from historical or heritage museums because mm -hmm. we don't have a collection per se we don't yeah. have a collection as you said before you had a collection of heritage museums always have a collection we didn't really have one we have a small collection from the previous shows that we've uh, mm -hmm. put up before so but they were mostly student work Right. And that is not to demean or belittle their work, but it is definitely not as it doesn't have a historical value mm -hmm. as much. Yeah. Yes, and and it's a lot less work compared to maintaining. Yeah, a big collection of old objects. Yeah, it is. Art handling definitely is has it takes it on a different form in contemporary it art does, gallery. It does. It, I'm sure you have to. Well, we always have to wear white gloves, and when handling artwork, have to put out. Um, a sort of plastic sheet or even just sometimes you have to make do with what you have so we put cardboard um, boxes mm. sheets onto the floor before putting the artwork on top so that's really basic stuff that you have to do but I'm yeah. sure heritage museums you have to be oh, like, like strict like careful do cardboard because there's yeah. like acid free paper yeah buffer paper some, yeah some items you have to use non-buffered paper yeah um, powerless gloves versus cotton gloves oh for yeah, yeah material so. yeah yeah, but our conservation as well, there's, they're two different disciplines, but it's nice. Um, so, being, um, I know that you were the only Asian in your, um, in the staff team at the gallery, um, and being part of the curating team, how do you think, is there a stylistic different or a different perspective in viewing um, how to exhibit things? because of your cultural background, do you think? I think uh, in terms of difference in perspectives or our take in curating, everyone has their own approach. So we, I was in a team of eight people, of eight students. We're all close friends because our faculty is kind of small, so we basically know each other. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of coming up with a concept or a theme for the exhibition, I would say culturally it was it, I'm not sure if it has it had a big influence because our theme was very much about um, our theory versus practical art making. So it was we we're playing on at that dynamic between the two, which is a very heated topic of debate. Uh, back when I was still in school, amongst my cohort, we were always arguing whether we like theory or whether we just want to spend the time that we're using on theory to make art instead. So some people thought. It was a waste of time. Theory, it's, I just want to make art. Some people found it fascinating and they went on to further studies to go on art theory. And that's, I, there's no right or wrong, but the two were definitely, people were definitely arguing which one was better. Mm -hmm. And that kind of conflict or struggle between having to choose between the two was what gave us the initial idea of having the uh, exhibition about that, about that struggle, which I think is always conflict is always a good is a good point to start any project or any yeah. debate, right? So then, that the idea for that exhibition was very much about a conceptual conflict, not so much a cultural one. Mm. But then inherently, I I feel that when whatever work environments you're in or whatever projects you're working on, your cultural influence just kind of find ways to seep into. Your yeah. thinking, even to the ideas that you contribute, right? Yeah. Like for myself, when I was working in the gallery, it was I was the only one of four. It was it was a small team. It was a, a team of four or five um, students working there. I was the only Asian, and I didn't. It totally went unaware. I was unaware that I was the only Asian because 
I didn't see, we, we didn't have any sort of cultural racial conflict between us and it just wasn't a very political work environment. Some people have very political work environment and those mm -hmm. topics come up quite often between mm -hmm. the colleagues but it didn't really for my work and I guess I didn't realize until I, I was almost done with the work mm -hmm. and I look back and I reflected upon my year working there that I find myself, I found myself interested in topics or I guess social or political topics that I wasn't interested in before but that was because my colleagues were talking about them so much. Mm. I found myself interested in First Nation art and any sort of indigenous related research papers. I was reading them, I was researching them, started taking classes about them but that's it all stemmed from the fact that my friend was at work was talking about it so much and in that sense I feel like there's a cultural exchange. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure if there was a direct contribution per se from my Asian heritage into the work environment so much mm -hmm. but definitely it's you internalize it so much that yeah. you don't you, you, you don't even you're not aware that you're doing that. Yeah I, I think especially in art and cultural institutions when the small team work together the conversation is really important. Yeah, I think we for us too. Like in the office, there's a lot of time spent on talking, talking. I and mean, it's not just talking about the exhibit itself, talking about what's happening, talking about ideas, talking about what's happening in the museum world. So you get up to date with the outside world, with what, especially for us, maybe less for our gallery, but with uh, museum technology and with. Um, display methods or with ethics or ethics is a big thing yeah because sure. you know how a while ago in the Boston Fine Arts Museum um, there's a Monet painting with a woman in kimono and then they had Japanese costume out where visitors can try on the costume and take a photo with the painting and it was it received a lot of criticism as like is this colonialism is it imperialistic is it cultural and sensitive, are we going back to orientalism, that letting uh, in a, in a uh, western country and have its visitor try on cultural clothing item as, you know, as if you're going to Disney, yeah, wearing as a a Mickey, Mickey Mouse ears, ears yeah. and taking a photo of Mickey Mouse, is that, is that equivalent to that, is, is it, is that visual experience in galleries and museums in the 21st century still so commercialized and commodified. Yeah, I think that's, even in recent years, I think it's becoming more of a, a topic of debate. I, not just in the art industry, like in general, there are a lot of debates about whether or challenging our idea of what Orientalism or what cultural and sensitivity is because yeah. I think a, two, a few days ago it was Australia Day and Google had up the logo on their homepage portraying indigenous people uh, as as a sim as a sort of like a, a tribute to Australia Day and there was a heated debate around whether that's basically being culturally insensitive mm -hmm. because that's not the whole of Australia it's not like how do you define what the national symbol is of a country? How do you define, yeah. like when people think of Canada, maybe they think of totem poles, maybe they think of First Nation art, and, but then there will be also people arguing both sides, is that is that representative of a whole nation? or? Mm -hmm. But if we ignore it, at the same time, it will, we're being culturally insensitive as well, so yeah. we're, there's a fine line between the two. Definitely. I think that's the same with what you're saying about um, Asian immigrants or Asian Canadians in, in Canada, it's that some some part of history is forgotten. It is, and it's yeah. forgotten and you don't it's not represented in modern times and we have to challenge whether that's okay or not. Which yeah. it's obviously not okay that you forget such a big part of your nation's history and sometimes it's misrepresented as well. And I think immigrants often get caught in this transition of moving from one culture to another and they're so busy adapting a new culture when so in raising new second third generation kids i think a lot of kids have an identity you i think you talked to me in another conversation about identity crisis about you yourself being a third culture kid and a lot of 
second generation of immigrant kids yeah. and can Asian Canadian young young Asian Canadians um, have a lot to discover and internalize with um, who they are. They Canadian and they Asian, but they don't because a lot of people are caught in this transition of immigration, of living, um, of adaptation. Um, they like they don't get they are not as connected with local history because their grand as I said earlier their grandparents weren't here but they're also not connected with their parents' history because they never grew up they probably went back to their parents' hometown one or two three times yeah. in their lifetime so as an artist do you think um, yeah how do you is that a problem to you do you um, work on artwork in that theme or have you seen like curated works like that in the galleries? Uh, we have definitely, I feel like um, I would say almost every show we've had in the gallery had one or two pieces about identity crisis or about um, discovery of discovery, your discovery of your identity and it doesn't even have to be a, it's not, it doesn't have to be confined to ethnicity, nationality or your skin color, it, it's not even about that because culture is something that embodies more than your your racial origin, so to speak. So it, I definitely have seen at least one piece in every show about that. It seems to be a topic that people are very interested in and it's something that everyone can relate to. Um, especially in UBC, it's such a melting pot within the campus. You, get, you have people coming from every corner of the world and our faculty is Filled, I, I would say a very diverse faculty and people are very interested in that because everyone can relate to be, being away from home. Everyone can be can relate to struggling between maybe your parents, both your parents are from different cultures. And then on top of that you move to you moved country to come study in Canada. So then it's layers upon layers of cultural I guess you have to absorb so many cultures and do you do people feel the need to relate to one? Do people feel the need to erase the past and adopt a new identity? It's all these topics are always up for debate. So I would say students definitely had a strong connection to that topic. Mm -hmm. I myself did. I think I might have done something like that, but it wasn't a big <laughs> topic in my artwork per se. But um, I've I've participated in. Uh, I think it was I can't remember the club's name, but it was in a club in. UBC, sorry by club, I mean like student club, not like a <laughs> club. Yeah. yeah, so I participated in one of their um, exhibitions and it was about Taiwanese or Asian identity, I think. And I had the privilege to be in that show and people were writing poems about it. They were writing poems about their struggle, finding their own identity, finding a culture that they relate to. I feel like Canada especially, it's, it's so diverse. It, you almost create your own culture. Like it, when you ask what is Canadian culture, it's it's different when you ask that question now. And as a contemporary citizen, as opposed to being maybe in the 1970s or 60s, mm -hmm. it will be a totally different answer. And I feel it's the same for a lot of cities, major cities in around the world. It's kind of hard for me to pinpoint what Hong Kong culture is now. Yeah, you you can relate to before. You might say it was a fisherman village we were a colony, and you can say that with confidence, but now it's kind of, I don't know what it is. It's... Yeah, that's a very sensitive topic now. Um, I don't know what, how to continue this, because just to think about um, the Hong Kong problem, it's overwhelming. It is. It is. And I think for the past year, ever since it happened, that there were a lot of artists that came out and made exhibitions addressing that issue. In Vancouver. In Vancouver. Yes. And I've seen a few, uh, I've, I've seen the one in Center A. There were a lot of um, demonstrations and protests around downtown mm -hmm. and people were doing performance arts on it. And I never thought it would, that my city's problems would be such a big deal in a foreign country. Yeah. It's, that, that kind of brings into light that there are a lot of Asian immigrants in Canada that yeah. still care so much about their, what's happening in their hometown. Yeah, even for those who don't haven't really been there or lived there. No, but they were interested for sure. Yeah. And people it's were... not just concerning the political issues. There's also more fine arts have exhibits with a Hong Kong theme, but it's not addressing 
the issue politically or addressing umbrella revolution politically. But um, yeah, and these it's, it's like a new trend last year. That, Almost, it was a trend. Yeah, like it could be a political theme, performance art installation. That type of exhibits, or yeah. there's like far enough with a little bit of Hong Kong theme. So there's so there you can see how different artists have their um, limits or reach in the political say or expression in their work, which is really interesting. And and it shows that a lot of people are thinking about that. Yeah, I feel like especially artists have the power to address these issues and we kind of have I wouldn't say sheltered but we're in the in the zone where it's kind of the gray zone for artists that we have the artistic freedom to express these ideas without being called out for per mm -hmm. se. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Sometimes journalists get called out for um, for being too politically extreme. Mm -hmm. But artists have different channels to channel their expressive ideas that yeah. it's almost like it mediates the whole situation sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now, well, caricature is not so much of a high art form as what I personally think is it is because I do a lot of my research on caricature in the 19th century. But see, but see, but what happened with, in Paris, uh, Charlie? So, but have you ever feel if you step into the political zone too much, you you threaten as an artist? Um. I don't think, fortunately, I have not. Uh, that's because my my subject has never been too pol overtly political. But there have been instances where I was I was a student of a um, mainland Chinese professor, and tension has d definitely arose from situations before. That uh, oh. it wasn't we didn't get to arguments or anything. It was a very intellectual conversation about. Um, identity actually I think it was that topic was identity and we definitely throughout the conversation I realized that there were points that or um, I guess topics or viewpoints that we definitely did not agree upon mm -hmm. and that's fine it's if a conversation you just agreed with each other all the time it's not very interesting yeah but so sure. there have been tensions that arose from situations like that but definitely not in artistic in an artistic way per se because mm. my it just it's just personally my subject yeah of my art were not very politically driven mm -hmm. but I would say in the studio context that has that has arose yeah so see how it, it ties back to identity again like even if you're talking about tension within the studio I don't I think it's beyond um, a nation Canadian area I think. All Canadians have the same struggles, the same contemplation daily. Because you you meet people, you work with people, you talk to people of different background, but they are all Canadian. A lot a lot of people would refer themselves to as Canadian. So being Canadian is the contemplation, the struggle of a Canadian identity. Yeah, I would say being. Having having lived in Canada for for a good few years, it's I've observed that Canadian identity is a makeup of a lot of things. It's not just a, it's not just a geographic location. It's not just a passport. It's more than identity, and it's for me being an Asian Canadian or to be just being Canadian. It's it means having the freedom to contribute your heritage or your cultural background that might have been non-Canadian into. The Canadian society, and its Canadian identity to me is the makeup of those things. It's the makeup of an Asian Canadian. It's the makeup of a, maybe a British Canadian. It's the makeup of a lot of different backgrounds, heritage backgrounds. And as an artist, it's being an Asian Canadian artist is having the freedom to freely express those things in an artistic way. And that to me, it's the most important thing, part about being an Asian Canadian artist in a Canadian city. Well, thank you for watching our first episode. Next episode will be in Richmond Museum. Well, stay tuned. Bye! Bye.